Um, Biagi. Well, I grew up on Staten Island, um, and I had a lot of Italian American friends. And uh, I had one friend named Luigi Voltaggio, and he was a weird little troublemaker who looks just like that kid. <laughs> and um, I didn't want to call him Luigi, the character that is, because it's too on the nose, but Luigi actually has a brother named Biagio Voltaggio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't call the character of Biagio Voltaggio because that is too ridiculous. <laughs> So I just called him Biagio. But he's based on a friend of mine. And he's also kind of based on that third wheel movie character that we're all very familiar with. He's mostly inspired, actually, by Gollum. Um, and then there's like... Some Gollum. Yeah. There, yeah. I was hoping but just there's like a Frodo Sam Gollum thing that I was trying for a little bit with the three in terms of the types. Those types seem to work really well, like the straight man and then like the sort of like brawny or cockier one, and then the crazy wild card guy, you know? So it's like Joe, Patrick, and, and the other. Yeah. They're on a journey, not unlike Frodo and Sam. It's, it's the same. same. <laughs> it's literally the same. It's really the same, yeah. But I mean, even in like the Todd Phillips movies, I really like those comedies, like um, Old School and, and The Hangover also have that triad of, of characters, and uh, what's another one? Superbad does it really well. And Great. So, uh, in that same vein, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. In that same vein, uh, I don't want you to put a percentage on it, but I'm kind of curious how much of this does come from your personal life autobiographically, how much of these characters were drawn from that situation. I'm not asking you about your relationship with your dad, but I'm kind of curious. You never went and built a house, I assume. <laughs> so, no. Yes, no. <laughs> he didn't go through this. Um, so if not, how much this is autobiographical? Sort of where did the inception of this idea come from to begin with? Um, it's pretty autobiographical. I, wouldn't, I can't put a number on it. But I think that um, I did have a friend, Joe Toy, whose real name was Joe Ferranti. I only know Italian people. Um, <laughs> and I had a friend, Patrick McGuire, and we changed that to Patrick Keenan for the movie so that we didn't get sued. And... I know all these kids and we used to, the original title of this movie was Toy's House and I called it that because we used to go to Toy's House every day in the summer because his parents both had work. And we would, while we were in high school, from nine to five, for whatever reason, his house was like open season. So from nine to five, a whole bunch of like 12, 13, 14 year olds were like running a house all summer long. And I thought that was a good idea to make literal for a movie and just heighten it a bit into like a fable because I don't, I worry about making anything too autobiographical because generally your own life is not ever as, as interesting as you think it is, but if you make it more of a fable, then it's watchable. And um, some of that stuff really happened. Like one time, I think Joe, the real Joe Toy, um, we refused to pay him for Park Place and Monopoly and he called 911 for real on us when we were way young. And um, I don't know, a bunch of little quirky lines and stuff and are, are taken from reality. But um, I have a good relationship with my parents <laughs> and I never ran away and my mother is alive and uh, none of the parent stuff is really, that's more like inspired by like Calvin and Hobbes and sure, kind of sure. E.T., like Spielbergian, and like single parent and the Disney single parent thing. I was getting you know? some of that, like 80s uh, Spielberg parent situation. Yeah, like. Yeah. I, I, and I love that stuff. And I love what you said about uh, writing personally as a fable. Uh, I'm always talking to students here who half the time feel too afraid to write personally. Like, oh, that's, oh, that's not me. I'm not ever the thing I write. But then also on the other side, sometimes they'll be like, no, no, this is the story of last year when I OD'd. And if we change anything, then it won't be a story. Yeah. And it's kind of like, whoa, I'm learning a lot of information <laughs> quickly. <laughs> um, I had a question in the same vein uh, about character construction. Um, most of the time when we write a feature screenplay, we don't know uh, who's going to be performing in it. Um, I don't know if you knew anything about the cast or what the production would look like, but I had a very difficult time, in a really good way, uh, seeing this father outside of the myth of Nick Offerman, the man. Uh, but I think Nick Offerman, for those of you that don't watch Parks and Recreation or don't know much about Nick Offerman, there's a few fans down there, 
his career has taken off in such an interesting way, and yeah. I was wondering, I don't know if you could tell me anything about your thoughts on that. Oh, he's, I'm a huge fan. I've been a fan of his for y ever since Parks and Rec started, really. Uh, and then I checked out some of his earlier stuff. I mean, he's one of the funniest people I've ever, ever met. And a great woodworker, supposedly. Best carpenter, I've, among the best comedians, but definitely the best carpenter I've ever <laughs> met, yeah. And um, the movie, I finished this writing this movie in 2009, so it took ages to cast it. So it was never like I wrote it for anybody. Right. You know? um, it was, we never thought Nick Offerman. There were other, for a while, the studio who was making it, this small company called Big Beach, they were like uh, Bill Murray, Steve Carell, people that you can't, you can't get them, you know? So that's why it took so long, because they always, you should maybe turn the cameras off for this part, I'm going to get angry. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just really hard to get, these like white whale actors in the movie, it's a hard thing, but um, you try anyway, because what if, what if, they, what if they respond to it, you don't know. I spent 2010 doing rewrites and just trying to get it more and more shootable and, and just dealing with notes and stuff like that, and just trying to like, it was very long and very heavy on dialogue. <laughs> and then gradually it got whittled down to, um, you know the movie that you're watching, so and I don't I don't mind that. I think it's better to start with a comedy. I don't mind starting with a huge amount of dialogue like that because it helps people with the tone and understand what kind of movie it's going to be. Okay, know? so I have two questions from there, and that's all of that was, was is really interesting. Just a quick one. Uh, so Megan Mullally came after Nick Offerman. I take it. Yeah, they came as somewhat of a package. They're a package deal. Yeah, he was. And that's the yeah. most glorious package that Hollywood has to offer. Uh, yeah. She was killing me the entire. She's great. Film. Yeah, she's yeah. great. Yeah, that's a lot of her lines or verbatim like things that my that my mother has said during my during my oh that's upbringing. great yeah yeah um and so you said you begin your drafting process much more dialogue heavy yeah. um yeah. i think this is something for a lot of the screenwriters that's really important to hear like it is okay to begin the drafting process that way and then bring it down uh so what what does your sort of drafting process look like or what did it look like for this one i don't know it's just you never really feel like it's finished uh I don't know if, I mean, don't you ever read an email the day after you write it and you despise it? <laughs> you know, you're just like, man, I would love to send this email again. And I feel that way times a thousand every time I watch this movie. <laughs> you know, I just, I would still be changing stuff if they would let me, you know? So I never stopped rewriting the movie until the last day that we, uh, the last day of production. That doesn't sound like you guys, Elmo. Yeah, you're right there. But uh, it's also just with comedy, like jokes, they get stale. Even if they're new to someone else, if like I get tortured by how stale they seem, because some of them were written years before the movie started, so it's just. And we were really careful not to put anything topical in it, other than like Street Fighter, which is timeless in my opinion. You know. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say Street Fighter was the only thing that I noticed as being of a time. Other than that, this didn't really feel like mid '90s in a way that was hitting me over the head, or late '90s, I guess it would, it would be. Um, and I, this is not even a question, just like sort of a, a note. I loved the detail of actually including Street Fighter so early on and then harvesting that so much later in the film, having people really act in these. Oh, there's an, an, a huge computer-generated action scene where Patrick fights Blanca that's cut out of the movie. I, was, I would like you to see it. I would like <laughs> yeah. to see that very much it's so. It's truly awful. Yeah, you should definitely watch it. Um, <laughs> Let me pull up my notes. I have a couple more. Uh, and we're going to go to audience questions in a few minutes, so be thinking of questions, guys. I'd like to hear from all of you. Um, I literally have a note that says Biago is McLovin on crack. Uh, one thing I had, I had a question for, and this one is one that I've personally struggled with my own writing. Um, when, I don't know that there's a really easy way to answer this. There were so many moments in this film that I thought worked because of your ability to sort of juggle or balance the dramatic and the comic. And I think this is something that Sundance films, they, they, gener they generally tend to love this uh, in writing, and I think you did a really good job. And for me, the one moment specifically was when uh, the father is carrying uh, Biagio uh, after the snake bite, after he's urinated himself, and simply says, do you have asparagus? Yeah. And I loved that moment. Uh, I don't know if you can offer any tips or any of your own thoughts and, on, and questions and battles you might have with yourself when drafting about when it's okay to put in a joke like that at a high emotional moment. I don't know exactly like when, like I feel like that's just more of a, you just feel it out as you're doing the scene, you know? Um, but I do feel really strongly that comedy, 
like movie comedies drop the ball all the time with jokes in the third act. And um, so I was careful to watch a lot of comedies that stayed funny throughout because that's the biggest moment to me is when you're watching a comedy, like a character comedy and it's hilarious and the jokes are like flying pretty fast and furious. And then it stops being funny to resolve this plot that the stakes were never all that high for to begin with because it's a comedy, you know? So it's like, just stay funny. I thought a really good example of that was Role Models with uh, Sean William Scott and Paul Rudd. I don't know if sure, you've sure. seen it. It's a David Wayne script, yeah. And it stayed really, really funny. It got funnier in the third act, you know? And I think there's like a lot of Wes Anderson movies that still stay really funny in the, in the third act. And I, I think it's important to just like, if it's a comedy, like don't break that contract with people and like just keep being funny. Like it's definitely a point of pride that we still sort of get laughs even at the very end in the elevator and stuff like that. Like we just wanted to keep getting laughs. Megan Mullally's face in the elevator is glorious. Yeah, she's That's awesome. That, yeah, that yeah. totally makes it. And even when the saddest moment, like the kid's like killing the rabbit and skinning it and it's awful and then like the interrogation scene with Piaggio usually does, like plays pretty well. Like we just, just wanted to keep it funny. It was like a big deal to us that it just stay funny. Don't be a lame third act comedy thing where it just starts now like tying up these plot strands that no one bought the ticket for that. They just want the jokes, you know, so. I think that's an amazing way to look at comedy and it's something that I am always battling with it as well when I'm drafting things and, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that this, to sort of broaden this to those of you that are not just the comedy nerds in the group, it, it is really important to, to understand your genre and that's what I'm, I'm hearing really well is that they bought the ticket to, to, to hear laughs, keep that, keep that going. I, I think that's a really nice little lesson. Um, I had one more real thought. A lot of these guys are finishing their thesis projects. They're beginning their own film festival process. I'm a little curious. Uh, what has the film festival process been like to you? Uh, and, and, and could you tell us anything about the experience? Had you been through it before? Um, what was it like this go around? Do you get the same horrible Q&A questions from guys in tweed jackets and then go crazy? Or? I actually really like your jacket. Thank no, you. Thank you. Um, I've never, I had never been to a film festival before, uh, before Sundance, you know, and I, it was the coolest. I had such a good time. I don't know anything about the process because I went to film school at Columbia and, um, <coughs> excuse me, I was a screenwriting concentrate, so I never made a short film, but I know a lot of my, a lot of my good friends have toured the planet with their, with their great short films, and I think that is a thing that I was sorry that I missed out on, just being a, screen, a screenwriting concentrate, you know, so I'm happy that, that I get to do it now, because I've been going to a lot of festivals. But um, it just always seemed to me that there were two ways to, like, start a career up. It seemed to be, like, either make a great short or write a feature and try to sell it, and one of those options is free. <laughs> so I did <laughs> I did the free one <laughs> essentially. But that's not a good, you know, that's not sound advice. Was like this if your you first feature that you'd written? Yeah, this was yeah, this is my first so feature. So that's amazing. Yeah. It was yeah, we got I got very, very lucky every step of the way. Things keep going well with the movie. Like I was surprised that I finished it, then I was surprised that I got an agent, I was surprised that it got bought, and I was surprised that it got made. And now I'm surprised that people are gonna get to see it. But it, it keeps I'm waiting for the other shoe to fall. It inevitably will. Probably the weekend we open against Superman will be, will be that shoe falling. Yeah. yeah. I. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 I'm sure <laughs> that's that's yeah. that's not too much competition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at all. Um, yeah. They were like, our core audience is 17 to 30 year old males, and I was like, that kind of sounds like a Superman audience. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, it's not, not my so decision. actually, before I open it up, uh, what what is on the horizon? I saw that you're working on something. Uh, um, Are you working right, on right before right before we started production on this? I sold a pitch to New Line Cinema and I wrote that script and that's all done and that's casting. Again, that whole process is going to start again where they try to get people who will never do it and so that'll take years, I'm sure. And then it's set in Rio de Janeiro, so we go shoot it there. It's like an action comedy, romancing the stone kind of thing. I'm just trying to retrofit 80s genres <laughs> <into> <laughs> and, and throw kind of weird, like, you know, the, the humor of this movie into more movies I grew up with, essentially, you know. But um, So we can look forward to your version of E.T. soon or yeah, eventually, dude, maybe e. in a few years, one, you'll do yeah. a Jurassic Park theme. We could use a dinosaur coming of age comedy, I think. Yeah, well, the guy who made Safety Not Guaranteed is doing Jurassic Park 4, so you will probably get that. Um, Great, great. Well, I would, I, I would love to sit up here all day long. I have 20 more questions to ask, uh, but I, I would love to open up to you guys. What questions do you have for the screenwriter of this film that we just saw? 
Um, how much how much influence or how involved are you after you pass the script along and production starts and they start shooting? I mean, are you on set at all or do you keep revising the script at all? I was, I was more involved than I expected to be. Uh, the director and I got on very well and we collaborated a lot. Um, he definitely directed the movie and I definitely wrote it. There was not a lot of like bleeding into you know, categories, but we checked in with each other constantly and I was on set the whole time, yeah. And I was even in the editing room for like a couple of weeks too. So, but I think, you know, that's the independent film world. Um, there were not very many cooks in the kitchen, so it was easier. You know, myself, the director, and the DP did a lot on the movie. There weren't, you know, 10 producers like there might be on in a studio movie. So it was, yeah, I was pretty involved, yes. I noticed the movie's very uh, character-driven. I, I was wondering if you have any uh, advice on, uh, during the drafting process, you know, creating these these distinct characters as you're, as you're doing the story? I don't know, it's funny. It was really a conscious decision to try to do something character driven because I had started a million scripts that had high concepts and I never finished any of them because you get bored. If you're not invested in the people, it's boring to write and it's boring to watch too. <laughs> but um, like tons of high concepts. I mean, look, I'm 31, so Everyone my age thought they were going to write a Charlie Kaufman movie, you know, and it's just not going to happen. So I think when I decided that it would be more about people, I just started thinking about the most interesting personalities that I knew in my real life and those contradictions. I think it's important to contradict them all the time. Like, you know, in the script, Joe is a pipsqueak with a huge ego and much more type A and Patrick is a football, like a wrestler with an injury and kind of like much more muscular and he's the total like beta in the equation of like we're gonna move out. I just thought it was like trying to find contradictions I guess is, is a good way to start thinking about people because in reality people are that way. But mostly it's like just observe the people that entertain you the most in your real life and steal from them <laughs> essentially. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming out. I just want to say uh, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I really enjoyed it, and I think that all of us are going to tell our friends to go see it as soon as they see Superman. You can, you can see Superman. Just buy a ticket to this. <laughs> Here, see Superman, by all means. Fair. I'm going to do that. Um, Thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you.